how Paul looks at who Jesus is. The first thing I want us to do is remember that Paul was not an original disciple. You have to remember this. Paul was not an original disciple, but he actually came on the scene as an enemy of Jesus Christ. Yes, he did. He hated everything Christ stood for. Right. Wherever the church gathered together, Paul was there to try to disrupt and tear it up. See, Paul saw the Christian's claim of the deity of Christ as blasphemy. Mm -hmm. The reason why, because let's look at it. Paul first was a Roman citizen. He was born, he had Roman birthright from a devout Jewish family. Who remembers what city he was born in? Tarsus. Tarsus. Okay? And when you look at Paul's writing, a lot of his writings have a Stoic influence. Now, Stoicism was a Hellenistic or a Greek philosophy. And pretty much what they taught was that destructive emotions came from errors in judgment. And the best thing you could do was control your will and put it in line with, with nature. But Paul also relied on what he learned from Gamaliel, who was a Jewish or Pharisee teacher. Huh? Oh. And so we've got one side that has a Stoic or a Hellenistic philosophy, and then we've got another side that is a Pharisee that is trained in the law and in Judaism from this Pharisee background. As a matter of fact, does anybody know what Philippians 3, 5 says? Let somebody read that, please. Philippians 3 and 5. You didn't have to read it, just, just stay there. Or stay in Philippians. Anybody have it yet? Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. So here, this is what Paul is saying. By the law, I did it right. I was circumcised on the eighth day. Means I, I followed the law, or my parents followed the law for me. Mm -hmm. I'm of the stock of Israel. I can trace, trace my lineage back. All of my forefathers were Jews. Of the tribe of Benjamin, I know where I come from. I know what my heritage is. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. And it's touching the law, or in other words, as being right where the law says I should be, I was a Pharisee. But then I jump down to verse 7, and he says this. But what things were gained to me, those I counted for loss for Christ. In other words, what Paul was saying was all of that stuff didn't matter. So what we want to do is we want to understand Paul's idea or his view of Christ. Because if Paul was converted, it must have been on some sound evidence. It must have been on something that was really, really good. Because remember, he was out there trying to destroy the church. So the reason why I said stay there in Philippians, we're going to look at a few verses here. In Philippians chapter 2, we want to look at Paul's uh, definition of how he saw Christ, his understanding. And we're going to focus on chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Okay, so in this passage we see Paul revealing his understanding because we're tracing the life of Christ from eternity past through his earthly life, through the death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension and infinite future. But Paul uses two words that are of great importance for our understanding. The first word Paul uses the word form when he says who being in the form of God the word form comes from a Greek word. Let's see if y'all recognize this word, unless you, unless you already know it. 
for them. What words did we get there from that? That means change. Okay. What other words? Um, metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. That's where we get that word from. If, if any of you are have your strong concordance, it's uh, 3444 in there. That's where this word comes from. But when we look at this word, especially when you see what Paul is saying here, he says, who being in the form of God, we must understand, we, we must grasp this one truth. Nothing can be in the form of God that wasn't already God. You don't become God. If he was in the form of God, he was God. And that's why, as a matter of fact, some writers say that the translation actually in the Greek says, who subsisting, not who being, but who subsisting in the form of God. Or they're going to violently hate him. And these are the ones that want us to kind of tone it down a little bit so Jesus ain't so holy. He, we definitely don't want him to be God. And we definitely don't want him to be all that. Just, just Let's just make him a nice man, nice prophet. He, he's a good teacher. And besides that, I think God has the ability or at least he showed the ability to use human language to perfectly communicate his message. God has that. God can do that. We don't, God don't need to accommodate. He, because God is a God of truth. So he's going to tell you the truth whether you want to hear it or not. And most of the time in our lives, we didn't want to hear it. I know I didn't. I didn't want to hear God's truth. It was contrary to how I wanted to live my life. But I was, I was, <laughs> I was headed for some trouble and didn't even know it. But now I want to stand on that. Second, if, if, if God allowed this, then that would mean that God has acted contrary to his character, which the Bible says he can't do. So again, it would make God a liar. See, we, we, we need to, you know, Doc brought up some good points the other night when he was talking about motives. And we need to look at the motives of people when they start challenging things of our Bible. There are motives behind a lot of this. And we need to seek to understand because a lot of people, they will tell you things like, well, you know, it's not that important. And it's what they're trying to do is just chip away a little bit at a time. Do you know, in our society, one of the reasons that we have been so welcoming of late of homosexuality is not because of the, the, the parades, it's not because of the rhetoric, it's not because of the debates, it's not because of any of that. The reason that we have become so tolerant is because 30, 40 years ago, they started showing us gay folk on TV that made us laugh. Anybody remember the show Three's Company? Mm -hmm. Remember the homosexual, Don Knox played a homosexual? A flaming one, and I mean, he was an, it was an hilarious thing. See what the devil does, especially on the idiot box, and that's why it's important for us to watch what we watch. Carol's like, well, I don't even watch so. But, but, the reason why it's important is because what the devil does is he makes us laugh at stuff so it doesn't appear threatening. And when it doesn't appear threatening, then we just kind of forget about it and put it to the side. And so then when the people come up, it's like, oh, well, they're all right. I used to watch about them. I know about them. And what you don't understand is the destruction that is caused by different aspects in our society. So we have to, again, we have to keep an eye on that. Fifth point was that the uh, inerrancy overemphasizes the divine aspect of scripture and neglects the human aspect. 
again, this is one of those, this is one of those challenges. I'm like, really? It's a divine book. It's the word of God. It ain't the word of us. Nowhere in, that, in here do I hear it say, and the word of God and man came to me saying. No, it is the word of God. So it will overemphasize the divine because guess what? That's what we need. I don't need the word of man. Word of man is what got us here. I need the word of God. But see, also, if it was the reason why, again, we talk about <laughs> motives. And I think Gruden brings this out beautifully that one of the motives is if we look, the Bible becomes more human, then it's more open to error. And if it's more open to error, then of course it can't be divine. They are trying to destroy the divine nature of Scripture. And of course, the, the, the always popular. There are clear errors in the Bible. Those who deny inerrancy see errors where there are none. That's why we, I, I tell folks all the time, scripture, interpret scripture. Don't just look at one verse about a subject, concerning a subject. Study all you can on that subject. You know, if you're going to talk about prayer, then get a good grip of prayer. Don't just read one verse about prayer and say, I understand prayer, because you don't. Because if you did, you would understand there are different types of prayers. There are different prayers for different seasons. There are different, I heard somebody say, well, uh, we always have to close our eyes and bow our head. No, you don't. Sometimes you can stand up. You know, look in the Bible, there are times when people stand up in front of God, raise their hands and pray. Sometimes they fall to their knees. Well, there's nowhere in the Bible do we pray in public. Jesus said, I said apparently you ain't reading your Bible. Because one of the most powerful prayers I remember is when Solomon anointed the temple. And he stood out there praying. And he prayed so powerfully that the Spirit of God came down. That's where we got the first instance, well not the first, but Shekinah glory came down upon the temple so powerfully the priest couldn't even get, they couldn't even go to work. Because the glory of God came down. Now that's prayer. Man, I'd love to see that again. Yeah. I'd love to see that. Where, where God's people just pray so powerfully that your kind of glory just rests in our presence. That's prayer. So you see, people, when they say that there are clear errors in the Bible, what they're doing is they're making up blocks, obstacles, to keep themselves from knowing the truth. Again, they don't want to admit God. And, and not only that, because a lot of people will accept that there's a God. What they won't accept is that there was a God that died on the cross for them. The cross. That's why Paul said it's a stumbling block. It is a stumbling block. The cross of Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to those who don't believe. It'll trip them up. 